We don't live in a world of science and reason. If we did, there would be no climate emergency. Instead, we live in a world of politics, a world of opinion, of ignorance, of selfishness, where the people in charge are there because they're popular, not necessarily because they have the best ideas or the best understanding of what's going on. From time to time, I get comments from people on the channel saying, it's futile for scientists to try and tell governments about climate change or to try and tell the public about how bad things are because if that sort of approach was going to work it would have worked years ago but the count everything channel tries to be positive now and again at least so in this video we're going to see the story of a single scientist who managed to win the confidence of the british government and if our civilization can be saved a lot of it will be down to him First of all, though, we have to understand just how unscientific members of parliament and politicians are. Several years ago, the Royal Statistical Society asked British members of parliament, if you were to have a coin and you tossed it twice, what are the chances that would come up heads both times? Well, there's one in two chance of getting heads, so you need to get heads the first time. And then after that, if you toss the coin a second time, there's a one in two chance of getting heads, so one in two times one in two is one in four. If you've got the answer one in four or 25% of the time you should get heads. You have a better understanding than most members of parliament in Britain. About half of them got it wrong. But most of them thought they had a good grasp of maths, which I think sums up the, um, the egos of politicians. But it's not just a problem in Britain. Here's something from an inquiry about how governments cope with COVID and how the politicians struggled to understand the science. It was difficult at times to get the then Prime Minister to fully absorb concepts central to Covid, such as how lockdowns can flatten infection rate curves. Boris Johnson last studied science at the age of 15 and would be the first to admit it wasn't his forte. Johnson found it was a real struggle to understand some graphs. He was bamboozled by modelling and would fail to understand ideas he had had put to him six hours earlier. This was not an issue just for the UK. On a group call with scientific advisers from various countries, when one said their leader could not understand exponential curves, the entire phone call burst into laughter because it was true in every country. Understanding exponential curves is an important part of understanding climate change because when a big earth system collapses, it reaches its tipping point, it suddenly transitions to a new state. That rate of change, it tends to be exponential because all tipping points are self-amplifying. So an exponential change, even increase or decrease, is always about the rate of increase or rate of decrease increasing all the time. So you start off with a small change and it quickly ramps up. Anyway, this video tells the story of Sir David King and how he may have saved the world from the climate emergency partly through luck. In 2001, there was foot and mouth disease amongst the cattle in Britain. It was spreading quickly across the country. Sir David King was the chief scientific advisor for the British government between the year 2000 and 2007. He advised the government on what to do. He put together a team. By the use of maths and science, his team were able to predict how quickly the disease would spread through the cattle because it was an exponential increase. And when they put in measures to stop the spread, when they started culling the cattle, they were equally able to predict with quite some accuracy the rate of decline. Well, meeting the Prime Minister every day for three months, Tony Blair, the then British Prime Minister, realised that science is different to other things. Remember, Prime Ministers meet every day people who want something, who try and persuade them of their own point of view. Tony Blair realised when scientists tell you things, you can trust them. They are reliable sources of information. Sir David King was very concerned about climate change. So once he'd won the confidence of the British Prime Minister, he set about a mission to save the world. He got a scientific advisor allocated to every government ministry. My mind boggles. They haven't always had the uh, scientific advisors. And some of them even then tried to resist it. Also, Sir David got every British embassy around the world to have its own climate attaché. Remember, climate change was a global problem. 20 years on, the British civil service is still trying to become more scientific. For example, 
half of all of the graduates who are going to be put on the fast track system, the graduates who will be the future leaders of the civil service, half of them now need to have a science background. So David produced a report showing how Britain was likely to be impacted by flooding by the year 2080 due to climate change. Members of Parliament started to take it seriously, although they asked him not to tell the public how serious it was. So when sometimes people say the government is not being straight with us about climate change, they have got a point. There are times when the government, at least once, has tried to restrict restrict information about climate change from the public. The report is available online, though, because one of Sir David's demands was every advice he gave to the British government needed to be public. Sir David visited countries around the world to explain to them about climate change, to make sure they realised how serious it was. He, he says it was something that was easy to do to win people over because the climate attaches had already been working at it and already winning people over. He said it was easy to do except in the United States of America where he believed it was the big oil companies that had too much influence. So in Britain, science and reason, trying to do something about climate change. In the United States, big oil companies just closed their eyes to what was going on. Later on, he came back as uh, the special representative for climate change for the British government, and that's been 2013-2017. You can see the difference between science in Britain and big oil in America, because in 1997, the United States Senate voted 95-0 to zero that the United States government should not enter into any agreements that would mean the United States had to reduce its CO2 emissions unless China did, even though China had a very low uh, CO2 emissions at that time. Where in Britain, when they introduced the Climate Change Act in 2008, about 10 years later, 650 members of Parliament voted. Only five of them voted against the Climate Change Act, and the Climate Change Act commits the British government to reducing CO2 emissions, not as part of an international agreement, but just on its own terms. The British government would, would this is before Paris 2015, the British government had already committed itself to making quite large reductions. Why? Why didn't they listen to Big Oil? Because Sir David had been round talking to them about science. When Sir David would go to the United Nations COP conferences, which is where countries try to make progress on climate change, each country would send along 20 delegates each. So there's 197 countries involved. That's an awful lot of delegates. But the United States would send along 150 delegates, not because they wanted to make progress on climate change, but because they wanted to tell the other countries not to do anything. Can you see the difference between a world dominated by big oil and a world where science should have been used instead? But people always say, but what about China? The United States Senate was quite right. Unless we sort China out, there's no hope. So Sir David did do something about China. He spent a year researching the impacts of climate change on India and China, working with Indian and Chinese scientists, you know, as an official project that the Indian and Chinese governments were involved in. And that report was published in, uh, let me just have a look at my notes, in June 2015. Well, the Paris Agreement, the agreement that all the world's governments are supposed to be working to, was signed in December 2015, so six months before the Chinese government and the Chinese scientists were fully aware about how serious climate change was and how the impacts would affect their own countries. It wasn't just a philosophical thing, you know, if the United States isn't going to cut its emissions, we're not going to cut ours. Come Paris 2015, it's something the Chinese and the Indian governments wanted to do. They weren't being told to do it by ex-colonial powers. It was something they wanted to do. And Sir David had been actively working with them to help them to do that. Also before the COP in Paris in 2015, uh, Sir David met with Pacific Islanders, Australia and New Zealand. And at that time, Australia recommended to the islanders, don't worry about climate change, just grow your economies as quickly as you can. And then when climate change comes, you've got more money to deal with it. Well, the sea level rises mean... When climate change or the worst aspects of climate change start to arrive, those islands will be underwater. So that wasn't really a, a solution for the islanders. So Sir David got the British government to agree that when when they went to Paris, that they would um, 
commit to a maximum rise in temperatures of 1.5 degrees Celsius. So that 1.5 goes back to that meeting that Sir David had with uh, the Pacific Islanders and Australia and New Zealand. And the strength of the hand of the British government in Paris in 2015, he made sure the British government had set aside billions of pounds of grant to help the poorer countries cope. And the British government had been involved and had supported the... um, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and their scientific work. So if you compare Sir David's experience in Britain, where science was followed, with, for example, James Hansen's experience in the United States, where big oil was a dominating factor, James Hansen reports 2004, when he was critical of the Bush administration's uh, energy policy, he was banned from speaking out whereas Sir David was paid by the British government to speak out and to speak out all the way around the world. Can you see the difference it would have made to the world if, what, 20 years ago, science had been the dominating factor all over the world and not politics and influence and lobbying and all those sorts of things? So that's that's the story of David King. It's a quicker video this, this, uh, this week. But there are two other... Prime Ministers or Chancellors who need who need to be mentioned. If you look at the list of European Prime Ministers, European leaders, most of them have backgrounds in law or business. Quite a few of them have backgrounds in medicine, which is sort of scientific. But the two people who stand out as being proper scientists, number one is Margaret Thatcher, and the other one was Angela Merkel, and they both have key roles in tackling climate change. Margaret Thatcher is remembered in Britain for all sorts of reasons, but here's one thing she did where she spoke out very early on about how countries need to respond to climate change. We are now seeing a vast increase in the amount of carbon dioxide reaching the atmosphere. The annual increase is 3 billion tonnes, and half the carbon emitted since the Industrial Revolution still remains in the atmosphere. At the same time as this is happening, we are seeing the destruction on a vast scale of tropical forests, which are uniquely able to remove carbon dioxide from the air. I believe we should aim to have a convention on global climate change ready by the time the World Conference on Environment and Development meets in 1992. 32 years ago, it would be much easier to tackle climate change. We need a realistic programme of action and an equally realistic timetable. Each country has to contribute and those who are industrialised must contribute more to help those who are not. The work ahead will be long and exacting. We should embark on it hopeful of success, not fearful of failure. We ought to give Tony Blair some credit for being a politician who understood the science and was determined to do something about climate change and he supported Sir David as he toured the world trying to save us all. Margaret Thatcher was a scientist. I think her degree or her doctorate was in studying how to get more air into ice cream to try and keep the cost down. But I think the one politician who was a scientist and did quite a lot to tackle climate change was Angela Merkel, the German Chancellor. And she was involved in climate change negotiations right back from 1995. So she was in charge of negotiations at the the UN Climate Conference in Berlin in 1995. In 1997, in Kyoto, she was in charge of the negotiations where countries for the first time committed in principle reducing their CO2 emissions. However, she has been criticised because when she was Chancellor in 2011, she prioritised shutting down nuclear power stations, which are a low-carbon form of energy, which meant Germany relied for much longer on its coal-powered electricity-generating stations. And in 2013, after five years of negotiations, the European Union wanted to reduce vehicle emissions. German cars are quite big and powerful, their emissions are quite significant. Being the Chancellor, she could not let the German uh, car industry be affected that way. So she blocked that legislation, which is not very good. But in 2015, she's credited with winning over Vladimir Putin. And Greenpeace have given her a special mention saying, without her efforts, it would be much more difficult to get the, um, the Paris 2015 agreement through. But thing about the Paris 2015 agreement was it was a success. So everybody wants credit for it. Angela Merkel, Sir David King, Barack Obama, who hunted down the Russian and Chinese representatives, 
finding them meeting secretly in a hotel room and got them got them to agree. The Paris Diplomats, because you know it's Paris 2015 agreement. It's a short video where I just wanted to give people credit for doing good things. I wanted to be hopeful. If the world can be saved, it will be down to a small number of individuals who've really gone out of their way to do something about it and haven't just given up.